just explain to anybody who might not know, what is Formula One? What do you do with it? What's, what's your role? Well, um, I think most of us know Formula One is a sort of top branch of motorsport, the fastest cars uh, on the track. Um, probably the most glamorous form of, of motorsport, but certainly the most technically challenging form of motorsport. And because of the widespread coverage of Formula One, it also attracts huge commercial support. So the top teams up until the last few years were spending something like a billion dollars a year on their projects. So Together? No, individually. Each? Each. So uh, because the success uh, in Formula One brings such a massive return because of the huge coverage. I mean, on average, we have... Um, at least 40 million people watch every race uh, live and then there's obviously a follow-up on that and then the general uh, spread. Um, those of you who follow it, we know that Audi are coming into, into Formula One uh, in a few years' time and the launch of the Audi Formula One project had more uh, hits, more coverage, more social media than the launch of any of their cars previously. So. Uh, a project that was going to happen in two years' time got more coverage than anything they'd ever done before. It's a billion-dollar marketing deal for Audi, but, but it works. It, it, for, a, for a company like Audi, they have to make the numbers work. So they wouldn't spend that money unless they were getting a return on it. So it's the most technically advanced form of motorsport. But I think like any, any form of motorsport, it's a fascinating combination of the drivers and the skill and talent of the drivers combined with the skill and talent of the engineers. Because if you're a great driver with a poor car, you won't win. If you're a poor driver with a great car, you won't win. Uh, if you're a, a great driver with a great car, you can't be beaten. And there's everything in between. And that's uh, a great fascination of Formula One. The cars are always developing. Uh, they're upgrading the cars every race. So the fans who are into the detail of Formula One have got a huge amount to follow. Um, I think one of the key things about Formula One, although it's a huge commercial enterprise, at its heart is the sport, uh, the competition between the teams and the drivers. And that's integral. You know, the integrity of the sport is vital. Because I think as soon as you move away from that, it turns into wrestling. Uh, and people, you know, our fans don't want wrestling, they want true competition, even though we try and leverage the commercial side as much as we can. So there is a relevance for shooting, which I'm going to come to, but there's a romance, there's a rock and roll. I mean, particularly in the years after the Second World War when small British sports companies were developing their, their products. Is there the same romance and rock and roll now as there was then? Well, I think, the, I think it's changed fairly dramatically. There's still huge uh, glamour in Formula One. I mean, if you go to Monaco with the boats and the... the the film stars and all the rest of it. But again, we get back to it being a, a really intense competition. Um, so underneath it is this, is this really uh, uh, hard-fought race challenge. But it has changed dramatically since after the war um, in all sorts of ways. The safety has changed dramatically. I mean, drivers, three or four drivers are getting killed every year after the war. Now, touch wood. We, we don't have any fatalities, so it's, uh, it's pretty rare. And I don't like saying that because, of course, uh, but it's, it's, it's very different. Um, but I think where Formula One's changed in the last five or ten years, which might bring us on to a topic you wanted to talk about, is how it is engaged with a whole new demographic of fans. Um, and it, it's done that by trying to improve the quality of the racing. But it's done that by also making the personalities involved far more accessible. If you go back to the 1890s, when the great London gun makers occupied the prime retail positions in St. James's Street in London, and live pigeon shooting, which petered out shortly afterwards, was the sport of the day, which became clay pigeon shooting, I think it's fair to say that that combination of skill and machinery was the Formula One of its day. We've lost ground since then, and Formula One has picked up ground. The question I'd like to answer with you today is, how do we in shooting 
get back to where we were? Can we, in shooting, get back to where we were? How did Formula One do it? Can we replicate that? I think what Formula One has been able to do in the last few years is, is offer the fan all sorts of avenues into the sport. So if they're a petrol head, they can have access to all the data on the cars, they can look at the onboard cameras, they can really understand what's going on with the strategy that goes on in the race. Uh, on the other side, we have a, a massive expansion in Formula 1 on social media and with a program called Drive to Survive, which is a fly-on-the-wall uh, documentary, it's several documentaries produced every year, you get to know the personalities. So the fans start to pick up on the personalities that are involved in Formula 1, and they start to follow their lives. Uh, and by providing those drivers with as much material as they need for their social media sites, we've just changed, as I say, the whole demographic of fans that follow Formula One. Uh, it's increased enormously in the last five years. And interestingly, it's increased very much with our, our female fans. We now have a 45% female fan base. 45%? 45%, which is uh, incredible. I mean, we run a shooting TV show, and uh, I regret to say we're 92% male viewers. But, but I'm you know, very proud of the 8% female, so that's a, that's a good start. Um, petrol heads, hmm, we got gum nuts. That wouldn't really work, <laughs> would it? Well, I think, I think you've got to look at... You, first of all, you've got to have the integrity of the competition. You must never compromise that. But can the competition be tuned in some way to make it more engaging? So there's a question of what should the competition be? And then how can you show different perspectives on that that fans can engage with? I mean, one of the big things that we did in Formula 1 was to put cameras inside the cars. So you can follow a driver as he's driving the car from inside the car. You can even get, we've got a camera now, it goes inside the helmet next to his eye. So you see exactly what he's seeing in the car. And then we have cameras all around the cars so they can get the perspective of what's going on around it. Uh, you know, 20 years ago, a little long, they never existed. You just saw the cars from outside. You didn't feel part of it. And therefore, is there camera technology? Is there content that can be captured with shooting? Uh, I mean, I'm always fascinated when I see camera guns and you can see the shot and the dispersal of the shot and where you are with the shot. And, uh, but is there technology that shooting could engage with which would enhance the presentation of a competition without spoiling the competition? Yes, I think there is. I mean, one thing we did with our, cam uh, our gun cameras, we, we turned them around and it's in many ways more fascinating to see the shooter's face when they take the shot as to see the, sm the small target exploding over there. Uh, and I, I suppose what's one of, one of the, the basic problems we have is it, it's, it's very small black things turning into dust at some distance. You've got nice big red and blue things flying past at great speed. I mean, cars are a naturally televisual subject, aren't they? So we would, we'd have to work on that. Yeah, and um, also ours is very much a team environment. I mean, we have the driver and the car, but you have the pit crew and you have the engineers. And one of the things we've found with Drive to Survive is those people have become personalities now. So the team owners have become personalities. And that's another channel of, of engagement that we've had with the fans. So anyone who follows it will know a chap called Gunter Steiner, who's become infamous in Formula One. But he was unknown before the TV programs started to explore the behind the scenes. Um, and there's a whole merchandise industry now around Gunter Steiner. And, and showing that side of the sport only enhances the sport. It doesn't detract from the sport. So the, the whole team thing is, uh, is very strong in Formula 1. That's been a big asset as well. Well, you have a following, <laughs> and you're just the boss. <laughs> uh, I did, but I, 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 I haven't got any merchandise that I know I of. Told so. you that, that <laughs> I've had more people excited about you coming here than, than any of the shooting personalities. Right. So we've got, we've got to establish the televisual side of it. We've got to establish the relationship side of it. I, I, the soap opera bit, I, I think that's terrific. The, 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 the building up of the relationship between the coach and the shooter. The, the, the social media side, I think, follows if you can do that. Uh, we've got to make it glamorous, I think. That's, that's one thing. A bit more rock and roll. What yeah, I think, I think in Formula 1, Formula 1 has moved from being a nerdy sport to being a sport people are, are, are proud of following. People are, you know, it's, it is um, 
I know it's a, it's a bit of a corny phrase, but it's kind of new rock and roll. It's, it's trendy to be following from long. We've got to make sure we maintain that. We can't, but it seems to be holding up. So people are now, uh, you know, I get more people talk to me about Formula One when I'm walking through an airport or wherever than I ever had before. And people from all sorts of uh, backgrounds are now following the sport. And um, so getting that engagement with a, a you know, widespread audience, uh, and uh, instead, just, instead of it just being a gun enthusiast sport, and, and we have petrol heads, and we want, to, we want to continue to make it entertaining for them. We don't want to alienate them, but we want to add this new uh, following. And, and taking the helmets off the drivers is how I like to describe it. So instead of just seeing a driver driving around with a helmet on, you actually start to understand who he is and what he does and how does he behave. And we have the bad guys and we have the good guys and we have the villains and we have the heroes. And, you know, all that is, is naturally evolved in our sport. You shoot. I do shoot, yes. You go to playgrounds. Yep. How can they brush up? How can they raise their game so they become more of this product you're talking about? Um, I mean, to be honest, when I go clay shooting, it's generally just practice for, for my driven shooting. So, but I could see how you know, the whole setup could evolve with, with team engagement. And um, I mean, I know people go... You know, there's lots of social events around clay shooting, but can that be... We just opened uh, in, in London. We've opened this fabulous Formula One center, which is full of driving simulators. And you can go there, have a great party, uh, have simulators, they all compete against each other. We have scoreboards. And I know that happens with clay shooting, but is there something more that we can do to make it more of an engaging environment for people who want to participate in? Well, with that one, you're kind of extending the brand. I mean, I guess there isn't a petrol engine anywhere near that particular at that particular place or that event and similarly we couldn't bring guns into central London to do that kind of thing but I suppose we could do we could do laser shooting couldn't we and then and then brand it up as the yeah I mean if you look at golf uh, these golf simulator centers have really taken off and we've based our Formula One center on that concept and it's been so far it's been hugely, hugely successful so which other sports provide you with inspiration do you look at tennis for example that's been pretty good I, I was fortunate enough, Gene and I were fortunate enough to go to Wimbledon this, this year, and what I'm impressed by is the sheer athleticism of the, of the tennis players. And I think it's, it's underestimated what great athletes Formula 1 drivers are, because there's intense concentration needed to drive a car at the speeds they do and the, the, the challenges they have. And they have to do that for two hours. And if they fatigue during a race, by the end of the race, they start making mistakes. Or they get beaten by somebody who's not fatigued. Uh, and you have to perform for that whole race at 100%. So you have to have a physique and training that takes you well beyond what's needed to be able to race for two hours without fatiguing. And I noticed that with the tennis players. You know, if you watch the men's final, they were playing better at the end of the final than they were at the beginning. Uh, and that just means their stamina, their, their physical fitness, never becomes an issue in, in the competition. Uh, and so that really impresses me, and, and knowing the commitment that, in my sport, racing drivers have to achieve that fitness is full-time. Um, there's never a moment off apart from the close season. Um, so it's relentless in terms of the fitness they have to have. So there's also other sports I see uh, comparisons with uh, football now you can start to see the, the, the players and how much mileage they've done each game and uh, how much they've run etc that becomes fascinating the fitness of the players so that side of things is always uh, very interesting to me but from a personal perspective fishing is my other passion so uh, I've fished since I was a little boy my dad took me and I fished all over the world for one enabled me to fish in some fairly interesting places uh, so fishing is my other passion. What kind of fishing? Fly fishing. Uh, what, uh, so do you pack a little travel rod with you or do you? I can do yeah it depends where we're going sometimes I just try and tack on a, uh, a, a trip for and after. Austria uh, often uh, we'll, we'll shoot off either before or after the race and have a few days. Uh, North America I've done lots of fishing around there 
uh, bone fishing in the Bahamas, and so yeah, lots of fly fishing. But you find the you find the any races that take place in the Gulf a little bit disappointing. Yes, yeah, it was more attractive. Going back to shooting, one of the nice things about it, I mean, nobody could accuse uh, our top clay shooters of being the most obvious athletes, uh, but uh, one of the nice things about it is when we have something like a British Open, we can have one or even 2,000 shooters taking part and rubbing shoulders with the greatest shots of the day. They might be squatted with a Richard Folds or a George Digweed, and they might actually get to shoot with them. We'd lose that, I think, if we... If we became as popular as Formula One. A distant dream, though, that is. Yeah, it's difficult. I mean, we, one of the things we've been very strong and encouraging is, that, is a ladder of success. So we now promote uh, the Formula Three Championship and the Formula Two Championship, and we bring those drivers to Formula One races. So their races take part in a Formula One environment. And those young drivers are working their way up through the channels till they get to full one because it is an elite uh, sport for only the very best um, and you know if if uh, the fans can follow a driver in Formula 3 and see him progress into Formula 2 and into Formula 1 but one of the challenges true challenges of, of motorsport is it's very expensive um, and again that's a challenge we're trying to meet we don't have uh, a huge female participation. We don't have uh, participation. You know, the, everyone who participates in motorsport has to have uh, reasonable income or reasonable resources to be able to participate. We're trying to find ways of broadening that opportunity for young people to come in uh, and encourage young women to come into the sport. So, um, but you're right. I mean, the great thing about shooting is you can be, and I've been out, you know, driven shooting and stood next to Simon Ward or other people like that and, and just stood there and admired their shooting. It is, it's a joy to watch, mm. isn't it? There are people who are politically opposed to motor cars, there are people who are politically opposed to guns. How do you get around that in Formula One? Um, it's true. I mean, you know, there's... there's we're, the biggest challenge we're facing in Formula One at the moment is the climate, the climate challenge. And the accusation of Formula One uh, is going the wrong way in terms of it being internal combustion engine, burning fuel, uh, hydrocarbon fuels, etc. Uh, and it's interesting that Audi have come into the sport faced with that um, image of Formula One being a polluting sport. And the reason they're doing that is that the rules for the future in Formula One will demand that the cars and the teams become carbon neutral. So what we have set is as a challenge for the teams, and you won't be competitive unless you meet this challenge. You have to be carbon neutral in the future. So we're supporting an initiative to provide sustainable fuels. So sustainable fuels mean that the carbon cycle is neutral. So the carbon that's absorbed in producing the fuel is the same as the carbon that's emitted when the fuel's burnt. So it's an expensive technology, but it works. And from 2026, you won't be able to compete in Formula One unless you have a sustainable fuel. So we're, we're trying to get laser shooting, which looked like a possible replacement for certain kinds of target shooting as a, as a separate sport. You're trying to get electric car racing, as I imagine, as a separate sport. Is that the approach? We yeah, I mean, right I, I think the reality is none of us can bury our heads in the sand. We can't all say, you know, go away, stop. Whether we, you know, we may well disagree, and we have to try and educate people to understand what country sports are about. And for me, country sports are a balance. It's a quid pro quo. Uh, I fish. Uh, sometimes I take a fish to eat. Uh, most times I put them back. Uh, but I put a lot back into the environment. Um, you know, we have a stretch of the itchin. We've restored it. We look after it. Um, it's something we're very passionate about. Uh, and it's this circle, because I know if we're not doing it, no one else will do it. We as country, country sport supporters, we know unless we um, support these conservation initiatives, do the work, no one else is going to do it. And for me, that's a quid pro quo of country sports. Uh, we take something out, but we give it more back. And that's the justification I have and how I defend my fishing and my shooting. 
That's absolutely brilliant. Thank you. Uh, if you see shooting as the next Formula One in a few years' time, it started here. Ladies and gentlemen, Ross Braun, thank you very much. Thank you.